Welcome to the Wheeler Centre. My name is Jamila Rizvi and this evening I'm going to be in conversation with the incomparable Ginger Gorman. So please put your hands together for Ginger and give her a very warm welcome. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet this evening on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as extending an extra special welcome to any Indigenous Australians who've joined us for this evening's events. Thank you to the Wheeler Centre for having us for what I know is going to be an absolutely fascinating conversation. Ginger's a friend of mine, so I managed to score myself an early copy <laughs> of this book, which I devoured within 48 hours, which I thought was remarkably impressive for a woman uh, with a three-year-old, uh, until I chatted to my friend Alice, who has two children under six, and told me she got through it in 24 hours. So I have been firmly one-upped. But that gives you an idea of just how readable this book is. And Ginger, it's not... It's not an easy read, and I, and I don't say that in the, you know, um, translated from Russian kind of, uh, you know, uh, Dr Zhivago kind of way. It's not an easy read because as the reader, you can tell that the person who is writing is experiencing trauma um, before your eyes as the story starts to unfold. So I just wanted to start with how are you and what was the process like writing this book? I, I know you described it in one interview as like being skinned alive. Can you tell us a bit about that? I do feel that and I mean there are points in the book where you can see that my mental health is really unravelling so uh, by the end of writing I was really drinking every day and shouting at my children and was actually quite unstable and I think the reason for that is I went in with what I since have learned is called radical empathy. So uh, these guys, and they're mostly guys, that are doing these terrible things uh, are very difficult characters and very damaged characters, but they also feel very unheard. So I went in with this deliberate decision about being open-hearted and open-minded. And the reason the book reads like it is and you get a real sense of who the trolls are and why they're doing what they're doing is because of that, but I paid a price for that. So uh, I am currently undertaking a course of specialised therapy for trauma in journalism um, to try and deal with some of that stuff. And I mean, I guess I wouldn't have gone in in the way that I went in maybe if I knew what I was dealing with. So I've been talking to trolls for four or five years before I started writing the book. I thought I knew what I was dealing with and I didn't at all. And it was so much darker than I ever dreamed. Um, and I guess I didn't protect myself perhaps in the way that I should have, but then also the reason we get the insights that we do is partly because of that. So I don't know if I'd do it again in the same way, but that's why the book reads like it does, I guess. And I think we, we're going to get into some of that darkness now and we're going to get into some of the experiences that Ginger had. But just a quick warning for the audiences, uh, both on the podcast, listening to us in the future, uh, and those that are here with us in the room, we are going to deal with some quite difficult content this evening, including some content about trolling that will go into the space of criminal activity and could prove really upsetting for some people, particularly if you've experienced online bullying before. Um, and we will also be discussing some issues related to suicide. And at the end of the event, I will go through all of the numbers uh, that you can call if you are feeling a little bit unsettled. But please proceed with caution uh, for the rest of the podcast. We will not be offended if you uh, need to turn it off in your ears or <laughs> take a bit of a break in the room. Ginger, you just reflected on the impact this book's had on you. You got a tattoo. I did. Um, actually, my mother found out because it was in the Canberra Times. <laughs> so um, one of the things that happened was... I that would be scarier than getting the tattoo for I me. Mean, just to give you a bit of background, is anyone here of a Jewish background? Yeah, my mother's of a Jewish background. So that would tell you how she reacted. She actually rang my sister and screamed at my sister. And my sister said, can you not ring Ginger and scream at her? But um, I, did, <laughs> I did feel very damaged on the inside. And I think that getting the tattoo, it's all down this side, was part of uh, wanting to wear the damage on the outside rather than the inside. So uh, I can't really explain it in a way that doesn't sound bananas, but uh, it did actually help me. And it was uh, a healing thing to do, yes. 
I, the Canberra Times actually <laughs> messaged me when I was I had been under the needle for five hours already, so I was quite Whoa. dizzy and sweaty. And uh, they said, "Can we sh- come and take a photo?" And I said, "Sure." <laughs> Yeah, I don't actually really in the re- first five minutes. I don't remember any of that interview really, but she did write a wonderful article about the book. Yeah, so I might not have been half naked in the paper if I hadn't been under the needle for five hours. <laughs> I want to take you back to when the concept for the book first came about for you, and for when it first began forming in your mind. You were working as a journalist for the ABC at the time, and you were researching a story about a gay couple who had used surrogacy to have children. Yes. Can you tell us what happened? So, um, the genesis for me becoming a cyber hate expert is really weird. And I mean, I never dreamed of this. I never was interested in the internet. I never was interested in technology. I can't even really use my phone. But what happened was I was ABC Far North's uh, drive presenter based in Cairns. And the LGBTI community in uh, that area has a really hard time. And I've always been interested in social justice, human rights, those kinds of things. And so I really wanted to do a series of features just about their lives and the way that they were treated. And I did this series of nine articles that were published online and they went on air on the radio as well. And they went on air on lots of stations. And one of the stories was about this gay couple who um, told me they had had this child via surrogacy in Russia. And it was a feature article. So it was ostensibly a nice story about this family. And I spent quite a lot of time with that family and quite a lot of time with that little boy. Then three years later I had moved back to Canberra. I was on maternity leave with my second daughter and I got the news that those uh, that couple were being investigated as members of an international paedophile ring and the investigation um, was being done by the New Zealand police, the Australian police and the United States police and I think straight away like because international police were cooperating I knew I knew that um, they were most likely guilty and they were found guilty in the middle of 2013. They were arrested and charged and put into jail in the United States. One of them was an Australian national, one of them was an American national. And, I mean... How did, how did that feel? Because we talk a lot about the trust that a subject has to have to the journalist, but as a journalist, you also trust your subjects when you become close to them. The thing that still stays me is that little boy because I spent a lot of time with him. And, I mean, I still think about that child all the time. I still have a lot of grief for that child. I don't know really what's happened to him. He's sort of in almost like witness protection in Mm. the States. I know that he's safe and he's getting a lot of therapy. Um, But, yeah, I I think about him all the time. And so that was really hard as a mother. Like, I had a brand-new baby and I was thinking about the time I'd spent with this little kid. And, I mean, the crimes perpetrated against that child by those two men are unspeakable. Like, he was shopped around from about the two weeks old and these these crimes that it's unspeakable the crimes that were committed against him and I mean I am a social justice journalist so I've done lots of stories about sexual assault and sexual assault survivors and abuse survivors and I know that um, the likelihood of his life turning out okay is not that great so yeah he's on my mind all the time still and I mean it's really hard because I probably will never know the end of that story but yeah, I hope one day he writes to me. I hope he one day he sees the things I've written and he writes to me. But I don't know what will happen. Yeah. And then what happened online? Well, so uh, what happened was there's a man in the States. His name is Robert Stacey McCain. He's quite a prominent journalist and blogger. And he uh, at one time was very high up in the Washington Times. So not the Washington Post, just to be clear. It's a conservative newspaper. But he had thousands of followers on his blog and on Twitter. And he start- blogged about me. And he was ostensibly inciting hatred about me and saying, you need to pay for what you've done. You know, you're a propagandist for the gay rights movement. Movement, and it was essentially saying that I was somehow implicated in the crimes against that child. And he used my Twitter handle uh, at the bottom of his pieces. So his followers did, in fact, take up his call to arms to shame me. And then uh, my family and I became subject of this orchestrated online hate campaign. And so I was just getting torrents of hate on Twitter. And there were two really frightening moments in all of that. The first one was that... Uh, in the middle of all this hatred, my husband and I were lying in bed, it was probably about 11 o'clock at night, and I got a tweet saying, your life is over. And Don, my husband, realised that my tweets were geolocated, so you could just about pinpoint our house on Google Maps. 
And then almost at the same time, Don found this picture of our family on a fascist website. So it, the photo had been taken from Facebook and there was all this commentary underneath it, a, a vile commentary. And that was really threatening because my mother's family had fled the Holocaust, a number of our family members were gassed in the Holocaust. And so those two things, the death threat together with that, were terrifying. And I, the thing I really remember about that is, you know, lying in bed, with adrenaline kind of pumping through my veins and then like hearing my little kids in the next room breathing asleep and just thinking like, did I just put their lives in danger because of my job as a journalist? So the, the cold fear of that stays with me still. Yeah. So that was the start of it. <laughs> so that was the start of the interest. Um, when something that traumatic and horrible happens to most of us, we run away from the topic. You kind of went diving on in <laughs> for the next however uh, many years. I mean, it did take a while. Like, after about 18 months, the fear died down. And then I suppose because I've always been a journalist that wants to go into those really dark crevices, I want to know what's happening on the edge of humanity, the difficult stuff about us. I started asking these questions, like, why would you send someone that you don't know a death threat? Like, why would you actually do that? send a stranger. And at the same time, so I was still working for the ABC at that point, a lot of my ABC colleagues were getting death threats, they were getting rape threats, they were getting pictures of beheaded women in their inboxes, they were afraid to go home and similar things were happening in the state. So it started to become apparent to me that this was actually uh, a critical issue, although my husband, you know, I mean, he's a person of colour, he's got quite bad anxiety. You know, he said, just leave it alone. Like, mm. don't go there, please. But I actually just couldn't. I just, I was like a bull in a china shop. Yeah, I had to. So you say in the book that it's a myth that trolls are these people who are sitting alone in their mother's basements and just hassling strangers for fun. What are we getting wrong with that assumption or that stereotype? Look, basically everything I thought about trolls was wrong. <laughs> so this kind of idea that they are alone is wrong, the idea that they're not very bright is wrong, the idea that, um, you know, they're not doing it with intent, they haven't thought it through, it's all wrong. The only thing that was right was that they are mainly white young men, um, sort of 18 to 35, not exclusively, but mainly. What happened was I ba I put on Twitter and, and social media, I want to talk to vicious trolls and you know I thought it would be really hard to find them and that was the weird thing like they wanted to talk to me and uh, so the hunting bits are, it's, uh, it's not true <laughs> it's true when you're trying to find someone who's perhaps uh targeting a particular person or inciting mm. hatred but in the sense that it's part of a culture and they're proud of it and they do it with intent and they're working in these huge international syndicates often so the way I describe it to people is like they're almost in big bikey gang kind of operations and they have presidents and vice presidents and they all know each other and sometimes they swap from syndicate to syndicate and sometimes the syndicates work in conjunction and they go out, they target a particular person either just to be vicious like predator trolling or for political means but it's very deliberate and it's very organised and also a lot of them are really bright, like super bright guys. So like Meeb Sheep, who is president of this very offensively named trolling syndicate called the Gay Niggas Association of America. Now they've named it that to fuck the media because whenever they do a big prank, they call it media fuckery and they want you to have to report that mortifying name. But anyway, um, you know, he has read all the big feminist texts and he has read everything, and so he's happy to have those big conversations with you, and often what he, he's doing as president of the GNNA is actually really politically motivated. It's very, very planned. So um, kind of none of the above, and also just far more terrifying that I dreamed of. Like, I did not understand that predator trolling was linked to terrorism, that it was linked to murder, that it was linked to incitement to suicide, that it was linked to domestic violence, that it was linked to real life stalking. I did not understand any of that. Like people say, why the hell would you do that? They read the book and they're like, why would you put yourself in that danger? I was really naive going to that. Mm. I did not understand that. So, uh, you know, um, whether it's stupidity or bravery, I'm not sure, but, you know, the result is the book and we now do know. But I don't think anybody really understood how those things were put together. Certainly the police don't understand it. Did you discover any commonality in what was motivating 
these people to behave this way or was were there just lots of different motivations? Look, none of the trolls – so there was sort of half a dozen trolls that I formed very deep relationships. I was in contact with lots of them and they were all incredibly different. So none of them were the same at all. Um, but there's research that correlates trolling with what they call the dark tetrad of personality traits. So it's um, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism and sadism. But sadism is the strongest link. So what that means is that uh, – they want to hurt you and they take pleasure from it. Mm -hmm. And so almost all of the trolls that I interviewed, regardless of their stripes, so left wing, right wing, predator trolls that just want to hurt people, you know, they all say, yeah, sure, I'm a sadist. I like it. <laughs> I take pleasure in it. But um, I would never say they're all the same and I would never say they're motivated by the same things either. So Mark, this really scary uh, troll in my book, he has no empathy in the way that we understand it. So um, there's a piece of research actually done by Australian um, researchers that says that trolls have uh, cognitive empathy but not effective empathy. Uh, what that means is they can understand how to hurt you really well but they don't feel for you. So that's Mark, 100%. Um, so he uh, wants to hurt people. He profiles people like rape victims, uh, LGBTI people, fat people, anyone he considers to have a vulnerability and he goes for them for that reason and he incites the trolling. But someone like Meep Sheep, mm. it's very political for him. He feels... He's fighting for a cause. He uh, thinks the media is too left-wing. Um, he hates Wikipedia. He thinks that Wikipedia controls information and so that's a really big target of the GNNA. You know, some of the big pranks they do are actually very funny, even though I don't agree with their methods. So um, they did a thing called the Sandy Luke Crew during um, Hurricane Sandy where they pretended they were basically playing into the racial stereotypes and trying to see how badly they could get the media to get sucked in to this racial profiling that they were doing. So they pretended they were a bunch of uh, black people that were looting and they created all these fake Twitter accounts of black people and they wrote these ludicrous tweets, like pretending that they were looting people's cats and things. Um, and it was... The, the tweets are ridiculous. But, you know, seven major media outlets got sucked into it and reported it as if it was a story. And so they were not only saying, you, society is racist, but they were saying the media are idiots. Mm. And you guys get... And I actually agree with... I actually came to agree with a lot of their commentary about the media because are we doing our jobs properly? You know, these were the questions that I started asking. Are we talking to the right people? Are we asking the right questions? And, in fact, no <laughs> is the answer. So it actually can be valuable commentary in some ways, although predator trolling is really different from that. So we have to be clear in our minds that it's not one thing, I think. Yeah, we've got a blanket term for a lot of, like, a complex system. Yes, mm. and, I mean, at the one end we've got mild pranks and disagreements and I wouldn't for a minute try to say that that shouldn't be happening on the internet. It should be. But that's really different from predator trolling at the other end, which is why I coined this term, where you people are coming to real-life harm, physical, psychological, both, and the misunderstanding about that in society and by the police and by the social media companies is profound. We, uh, there's a broad problem in the media and I think more generally in the community in terms of lack of understanding of totally. this problem. And you commissioned some quantitative research for the book because you couldn't find any research That's right. to rely on. Can you tell us what you found out about the incidence of trolling? Yes, yeah, so what happened was, I mean, I guess journalists are often looking for patterns. And once I started writing about trolling, I started in 2015 and then... You know, I did this huge investigation for Fairfax that went totally viral in the middle of 2017 that ended up with the book. But I started to just get torrents of emails from people whose lives had been destroyed by this stuff and they found themselves completely alone. And what I thought about when I looked at it as a cohort as opposed to individual cyber hate cases, I was looking at it and thinking, this is costing people a lot of money. Like, people were describing losing their jobs or multiple jobs, having their reputation wrecked online, having to go to court to try to stop the perpetrator, uh, you know, l loads of different costs, having to go to the doctor, taking time off work. So I wanted to know how much it cost and I wanted to know the incidents. And I thought if I could find this figure, then 
people would stop saying to cyber hate targets like me, you know, pull your big girl panties up, you're a snowflake, which is what you often hear. You know, you call the police, stay off the internet, love. Um, so I started ringing economists and saying, can you please help me? I need to know how much this costs. And most of them just kind of couldn't wait to hang up the phone, like, shut up, what are you talking about? What's trolling anyway? Um, Richard Dennis from the Australian Institute, who is actually quite a visionary guy, he got it straight away and he said, you know, this seems really important, we're going to get you the data. And so I commissioned this data from them and, you know, props to them, seriously, because they sort of understood something that no one else was yeah. willing to. I love an economist who acts like a white knight, like I'm going to get you your yeah, data, Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get you the data, honey. <laughs> so um, I, they did nationally um, representative polling for me and polled more than 1,500 adult Australians. And the incidence in the Australian population is about 39% of adult Australians have experienced some online harassment. So that's wow. any online harassment um, from mild to extreme. That's 8.8 .8 million Australians. The more extreme cyber hate and predator trolling, it's 1.3 million adult Australians. That is the same amount of people who've ever tried ICE, for example. So it's a lot of people. In terms of gender, and I wish I'd asked more questions about disability and other things, but I just asked about gender because I'd never done this kind of thing before. I was making up for so long. But um, I, th so um, it's about... 34% of men that have experienced it and 44% of women. And there's a danger in that figure that people go, it's nearly the same. It's not nearly the same. So men get harassed more about ethnicity um, and political beliefs and religion. In all other categories we ask for, more women get harassed. So more stalking, more rape threats, more death threats, more doxing, so your details put online and people turn up to your house in the middle of the night. So more everything violent and extreme and sexual women. Now, the cost is really interesting. So the aggregate cost to the Australian economy is $3.7 billion. And it's a really conservative figure because we only took into account um, time off work, so, um, sick, so sick days, um, medical costs and lost income. So that's only two things. So that's very, very conservative. So it doesn't take into account court costs, police costs, other kinds of costs that people incur. So yeah, that is just a red flag. But I've got the figure. <laughs> so yeah, now I think, um, you know, that's why it became a huge news story overnight. And that's what I wanted because this is just, an, it's absolutely ludicrous the situation we've currently got, where you've got people's lives being destroyed by this and nobody cares. Like, stay off the internet. I mean, who here can... Put your hand up if you can stay off the internet. Anyone? Who can stay off the internet? It's the pretty United... much like the advice of stay inside your house. Don't yeah. talk to anyone. Don't it's go outside. Like, yeah. It's like saying don't drive on the roads. So the United Nations rapporteur has just recognised internet access as a human right because we need it, right? We need it for employment. We need it for connectivity. We need it for everything, socialising, all those things. Netflix. <laughs> Netflix. We need it. So it it's victim blaming. Mm. Um, it doesn't take into account those serious crimes. It's impossible to do. There's just so many things wrong with it. Like, why are you saying to the victim to stay off the internet? Why aren't you asking the perpetrator to stop the behaviour? And also, <laughs> where are the social media companies in all of this? I mean... These companies are behemoths, right? They are raking in billions of dollars from our data and they have the best engineers in the world working for them. And at the moment they say, oh, too much traffic, too much traffic, sorry. I mean, can you imagine another private company? Like, let's say we had a car company that was putting cars on the road and they knew we were going to get killed and maimed in those vehicles because they were unsafe. Wouldn't they be held to account for this? Like, how are we allowing these companies to create a public space where we are in grave danger and they don't have a duty of care to us? Mm. I mean, keep us safe. Don't let people get murdered and killed, you know? Um, like, there's a case study in my book, Sherelle Moody, she's an Australian journalist. She was in my chapter about misogyny and um, she was talking about, you know, the misogynist stuff she gets online. She is a campaigner against gender-based violence. She runs the Red Heart campaign. And the stuff she gets online, like I watch it roll in and it is nauseating. Um, she, in the process of, I was nearly finished the book and she messaged me on Facebook and said, I'm getting threats that my horse is going to get killed. 
and her horse was killed. And uh, she went to Facebook, went to the police, and they did nothing. And a year earlier, her dog had been poisoned with acid. Oh, so, I mean, is this really an acceptable state of play that nobody's accountable mm. for that? I mean, Facebook published that. They were the publisher, you know. So this is why you've got, like, the law firm Morris Blackburn, Josh Bornstein, who's based here in uh, Melbourne. He is calling for these companies to have a duty of care to the public and for that to be legislated and I think that's right. Because clearly they're not going to do it on their own. They've been bleeding about this since 2006. Mm. They're not doing anything. Mm. It's that problem of the uh, societies and technology have moved so far ahead of the law and the law is lagging behind in catching up, but big corporates aren't lagging behind in making money off it. No, that's right. You know, so, you know, there's some really big questions here that we're not asking. Can I ask a question? You've referred a couple of times now to the gendered nature of trolling yes. and the gendered impact. And you talk about the experience of a couple of high-profile Australian women in the book. Sherelle's one, Catherine Devney's another, Van Battam's another one. Why is trolling so gendered? You talked about how it manifests in different ways for men and women, even though both men and women are trolled. What, what's causing it to be so gendered in its impact? Oh, look, you know, I mean, this is probably one of the things that left me feeling the most hopeless, that these guys are so young and they're so misogynist. Um, I asked Meep Sheep about this. So um, he's the guy I became friends with and my actual husband started calling him my troll husband because he talked to me so much. He described to me this kind of childhood that I think is really related to this. So these guys blame women for their problems, um, which is a very well-worn path, but they see, uh, they feel marginalised and they see feminism, and particularly white women, as the cause of all the harms against them. They're not looking at the bigger sort of sociological structures. Um, they are often economically and socially marginalised and the easiest thing to do is blame women. Now, Meep Sheep described to me this cohort of young men, which he's one, but a lot of them told me similar stories, where they had been brought up, uh, often by single mothers, but not always, but in really kind of violent, neglectful households, and they were completely left alone on the internet. So from the age of 10, perhaps 11, the oldest one told me 16, but usually pretty young, and then sat there alone in these chat rooms imbibing just hatred. So, like, in the cesspits of the internet, like Reddit, Tumblr, 4chan, imbibing white supremacy, misogyny, and then they get spat out as trolls sort of a few years later. And a lot of that is misogynistic. But I need to tell you a story because this is really dark, right? And I can sometimes see everyone in the audience sitting there, oh, my God, when's, when's this going to stop? But... There's a really hopeful story. It's actually not in the book because he wouldn't let me put it in, but I want to tell you because I think it's a really powerful story of hope. There was this one troll. Um, I was in contact with him for about 12 months and he was an incel when I met him. Do you know what that is? It's the involuntary celibate, these guys are. So they were a cohort of young men. They hate women, especially white women. They think that women are there for sex and that, you know, you can use violence to get sex if you can't get it any other way. So he was in that cohort when I met him or on the edge of it. After I'd had contact with him for a year, he actually said to me, thank you so much, Ginger, because I no longer hate women. And actually, like, he had started dating a woman, like Lucky Herbert, anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the thing is, right, this is actually a powerful story of hope because it shows that we cannot solve this with hatred. We have to bring our greatest humanity to this problem. And his hatred of women, particularly white women, could not survive the contact with me. Like, I would consider myself to be a reasonably kind, considerate person, and I did go in there with empathy. But this is a story about, you know, how do we change this? You know, I sometimes see a predator trolling and then the person being trolled responds with their own predator trolling. And it's like an eye for an eye, right? It's like mm. the Old Testament where we're all trying to get each other fired and, you know, whatever. No. Radical empathy. That sounds good. <laughs> but when it's, when it's you doing that work, how do you force yourself to maintain a mindset of radical empathy? Especially I mean, I when these individuals are going after you personally. 
as I would well. never for how do you do it well I wouldn't in a million years say that it solves everything like you're never gonna get someone like Mark who is brain does not function like the rest of us like he does not have empathy and I've had contact with him, with him for five years and you are not going to change him with radical empathy but I think this is a parenting story you know what I mean mm. like it, 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 these little kids are 10 years old when this starts we if we want to solve it you have to go in there and pull out the weed by the roots you know you can't pretend that we're not all part of the society that created these kids. We are. And did you find that when you were speaking to trolls at that individual level and you developed a really strong relationship with several different people, um, was understanding their experience, whether it was mental health problems or substance abuse or a lot of them had an incredibly complex and difficult yeah. Past, didn't I? I mean, look, people find it really hard to understand. Like, my I'm still struggling. <laughs> one of my friends said, you've got Stockholm Syndrome, one of my really good friends. Mm. Um, it, it's complicated. I mean, they are complicated humans too. They helped me all the time. Like, Meep Sheep helped me. This book wouldn't be the book it is without him because I couldn't access that culture. So, you know, I'm most grateful to him. I mean, he's really grateful to me because he feels like I've changed his life, but he changed my life as well. Like, he got me to see a whole lot of stuff that I couldn't have possibly seen any other way. Mm. So, I mean, let's not leave behind our humanity. And also, let's be able to disagree. Like... Part of what I think has happened online is that we can no longer disagree, we can no longer hear each other and we're so polarised. Like, if you look at the political stage, it's just kind of hatred versus hatred. Like, I heard Malcolm Turnbull speak at Safer Internet Day a couple of years ago when he was Prime Minister and was saying the internet created this. And I was like, look who's talking, dude. Like, have you seen yourself in Parliament? You know, <laughs> like, let's be real about this. Like, all these attitudes exist in society... And we're all in society. Like, you wouldn't have misogyny online if it didn't exist in society. You wouldn't have racism. Mm. So, you know, we need to look at ourselves as well and not just point the finger at these guys. We're part of the reason that they exist. And, you know, I mean, I would consider myself a feminist, right? But there are some extreme feminist behaviours that I think do marginalise some of these guys more. Like, Meeb Sheep said to me at one point, how would you feel if every morning you got up and you were made to be felt to be part of rape culture. How would that make you feel? And I was like, yeah, good point. I mean, you're, you've got a son. Like, that's not stuff you want him to feel. Mm, that's true. And I think that, you know, that there's those questions, those bigger questions about how we treat each other on the internet. And I'm not talking here about predatory trolling. No. I'm talking about sort of that low-level trolling and the way we all react online. And I know... It, you know, I'm often, you know, putting... I'm a journalist, so you put things out, you're tweeting things out, your opinion on different things or your thoughts on something. And if you make an error and someone catches you, your immediate response is shame and defensiveness. Yeah. And so you want to push back rather than saying, oh, wow, I messed up, sorry, thanks for picking that up. And it does create this sort of intense hatred. Yeah, there's a real... I mean, there's a few things in what you just said. One is that... For some weird reason, the social norms that we expect in society don't exist online. Mm. Like, the internet is so new, we're all a bit confused about how to interact with each other. And there's a thing called the online disinhibition effect. So you can't see me, you know, you might be more aggressive to me online than you would because you can't see my facial cues. Yeah. And I think we need to be real about this. Like, there's a troll in all of us, I think. Like, who hasn't wanted to be more aggressive online than you are in real life? But it's about how do we get the social norms that exist in society to exist online and not just with our manners, with everything. Like, you know, you see this, oh, free speech, sensitive, censorship on the internet, everyone's hysterical about it. You don't have free speech in real life. Like, you can't harass me at work. You can't bully me at work. If I'm in the supermarket, no one can say to me, I'm going to kill your kids and cut your uterus out, but they will on the internet. <laughs> so, you know, why do we accept these things? So, yes, down the bottom of it, we all have a part to play and I don't think we can be amazed that you have predator trolls at the extreme end of it. Can we go to the not just extreme trolling but the extreme impacts of trolling? Yes. Can you talk to us about what happened to Charlotte Dawson online? And then I was hoping we could sort of discuss that tragedy in the context of the legal complexities that this stuff brings up. 
Yeah, so um, Charlotte Dawson was a former model, television presenter, um, personality. She was judge on Australia's Next Top Model. She was a big personality um, and she was a very damaged person, which, you know, if you read her book, you can see that she had a lot of mental health issues. She had um, childhood sexual abuse. She was adopted. There was a whole bunch of things going on there. But she would get extreme predator trolled and people, you know, this kind of die Charlotte hashtag started in 2014 and people were telling her to kill herself, which eventually she did. And, I mean, look, you never know with suicide. Uh, suicide is never caused by one thing. There's usually lots of tributaries going into that. But I spoke to a lot of people that knew her and um, I think in my mind, in the context of all the other cyber hate targets I've talked to, you'd have to say that it was a contributing factor to her death. Like, they told her to do it and she did it. Um, and I tried to find the trolls that, for a long time, and none of them would respond to me that did that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there is a really difficult question here. Like, that all happened on Twitter. So this brings us back to social media companies again. Like, what, where are they in all of this? Mm. Um, I mean, and other places I found some of that commentary as well, like it's archived from 4chan and things like that. So there are a number of platforms implicated in that, yeah. and no one's ever been held to account for that. And I guess what you face here is a huge inadequacy with law enforcement. So you might go to the police station and get a police officer who knows how to deal with this, but mostly you won't. Mostly they don't understand the law, they don't understand the seriousness of it, and they have no idea how to investigate it. They don't have the technical skills or the resources. And, you know, all the states and territories have a patchwork of laws that apply to this, but there's a fantastic federal law under the Criminal Code Act. It's illegal to use a carriage service to menace and harass someone else. So it's illegal to use the internet to menace and harass someone. And that is very clear. That law has existed for 10 years. And I think the maximum you term you can get a jail term of three years for that, which um, there's... The Senate investigated cyberbullying um, a couple of years ago and the recommendations came out quite recently and they've recommended that that's five years. But the law exists, it's just not being used properly. And the I was same about with... to say, how often is, is, uh, is someone prosecuted or successfully prosecuted well, under that? So I didn't look at all the states, but I got data from New South Wales and from Victoria and it is increasingly being used, but most people got either a good behaviour bond or a $700 fine, which is not um, adequate if you've incited someone to suicide. Yeah. So someone like Mark has told me that he's incited three people to suicide. I can't verify that as a journalist but he's never lied to me about anything else, so I suspect it's true. Um, that is not enough if somebody dies. Mm. Um, so, there, and I mean, there's also lots of stories of people ending up in court and the judge says, what's Twitter? Yeah. No, I mean, that's not okay. You have to know if you are pre presiding over those cases, you have to understand. You've also got that distinction between individual trolls acting alone and then the syndicates you talk about or the pylons you talk about. You know, if it's if you've got a mob of 100 people physically, you know that one person is responsible for someone's death, you know, who actually killed someone. Yes. But online, you, d you don't know that if someone's being incited but to commit suicide. That, I mean, I don't... I think we have to require law enforcement to understand it and demand this of them. And the other thing is, I mean, the police can't get the information they need from the social media companies, which is also ludicrous. So one of these submissions that I read into the cyberbullying hearings was from the Northern Territory Police, and they described having to abort murder investigations and other very serious investigations because they couldn't get the information from Facebook. Mm. Why is that acceptable? You know, that we can't get the information we need from the social media companies. I mean, that's not okay either. <laughs> so there's a hu there's huge gaps there. And I've been told by um, someone very high up in the New South Wales Police Force, she's an expert in social media as well. She's got a doctorate. So she's a member of the police force. And she said, this is a problem across the country. So our police can't get the information they need from these companies. Can you imagine if that was a bank? I mean, they'd be required to, wouldn't they? You know, and I have to tell you, like, Watching the social media companies give evidence to those senators. I sat there through the whole thing. So representatives of Twitter, Facebook, Oath, you know, they, these were the industry representatives. They obfuscated every question. These are the senators. 
the leaders of our country asking the leaders of these companies, what are you doing about cyber hate? What's the resourcing? You know, how is this triage? None of the above. They didn't answer any of their questions. So, <laughs> I mean, that isn't okay either, <laughs> that you've got companies essentially, you know, avoiding democracy and avoiding their care to the citizens of society and the government. I mean, who's running the government? <laughs> like, what do you see as priority one? Obviously, this is a, a huge question and there's going to be, have to be a lot of different elements brought to bear to get any kind of legal control going on here, as well as corporate control. What do you see as the number one thing that needs to happen? What's the first order of business? The social media companies need to have a duty of care to us because we are not safe not just kids as well, like you always hear, you know, kids, oh, kids. Yeah, kids are vulnerable, but adults are just as vulnerable, sometimes more vulnerable. So, you know, yeah, I, I, I think there's a law that the Germans have brought in where, you know, these companies are fined 50 million euros if they don't take down cyber hate within wow. 24 hours. Um, you know, Human Rights Watch has said that's gone too far. It's cooling free speech. But the cyber hate's getting taken down. So there's got to be a happy ground in here in the middle somewhere. somewhere. through the middle. Yeah. Are you still in contact with any of the trolls that yeah. you spoke to <laughs> about the book? How do they feel about the book? Have they, they read love, the book? I mean, they love the book. Isn't that weird? <laughs> um, they, they're really proud of the book, which is interesting. So they, I sent it to Mark and he wrote back and said, this is a really good book. <laughs> Um, Mark's a really psychopathic troll. Look, I think they... Uh, <laughs> Glad he's pleased. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I had a moment to go, that's weird. And then I thought, you know what, actually I'm kind of proud of that because they call uh, left-wing female journalists social justice warriors. They call them SWJs, SJ, social justice, SJWs. Um, and he's always saying, you're a one-eyed SJW, you know. So I actually do feel proud because I thought, look, I wasn't so one-eyed that I couldn't represent them. And part of their problem is they didn't feel heard. So that's interesting. Um, and Meep Cheap said the same. Although there is a really weird bit where Mark made me... So there's a bit I describe in the book where I interviewed him for Fairfax face-to-face -face on video and uh, he leaves and then I'm kind of sitting on the stage completely nauseated and the cameraman's trying to talk to me and I actually felt really faint. And he said to me, could you explain that to me, please? This is like page 38. Can you go to page 38? And I'll, all of you will be going to page 38 now. But um, he said, like, I don't understand it. Why would you feel nauseated after meeting me? I was like, dude, you're a really threatening guy. You, mm. The stuff you do is morally, morally bankrupt. And I was in the same space as you and I was trying to hold you to account as a journalist. So I felt ill. And he said, right, I guess that's like trying to explain you know, what sight is like to a blind person because I just don't have those emotions. So it was kind of amazing. Wow. Um, Meb Sheep said the same. He wrote to me and said, this is a really good book. Um, and Craig, uh, he's a really left-wing troll who actually stopped trolling after I interviewed him because he said, I don't want to be a sadist anymore. Uh, he's yet, he start, he's just told me he started it. But, yeah, there's been no backlash at all because I represented them fairly. So, you know, when people say I've got Stockholm Syndrome, yes, I did get very close to them. I did deliberately break all the rules of journalism, but I still did hold them to account and I still did represent them. So, yeah, I haven't had backlash from them. I was quite scared of Weave. There's, Weave is the world's most notorious troll and he's connected to the Daily Stormer and they have a troll army, so this is a really right-wing website and they hunt people. And I don't have a relationship with him. He, I interviewed him and he stopped talking to me completely and it was the most horrendous, violent speech I've ever received in my life. And I went to bed for four days after the interview because it was so confronting. Um, I was quite scared of backlash from the Daily Stormer, but I haven't had any, and I don't think I will now. You have told us, and you're obviously still carrying a bunch of trauma from this, yeah. I want to end our <laughs> chat before we go to the audience on a lighter note. Yes. Can you tell us about the troll hunting selfies and the oh, impact yeah. they've had? So, yeah, so uh, my book came on a really hot day in January, and I wasn't expecting it, actually. I think... Um, 
my publisher, my beautiful publisher, Arwen Summers is here, um, and she did an amazing job on the structural edit of the book. Incredible. But she, I think she might have even been away. So I got the first copies of the book in Australia, and I wasn't expecting it. And I actually left the box on the porch for ages because <laughs> I didn't, I thought it was something my husband had ordered for his bike. <laughs> and then I ripped the box open eventually and was like, holy crap, it's my book. And um, my neighbour is my really good friend. So I ran across the road as soon as she was home. I was like, here, here's the first copy in Australia of my book. And she did what a lot of people did. Because of Arwen's amazing edit, it reads like a thriller. So she sat down to read the first chapter and stayed reading it till three in the morning and finished it. And she took a selfie of herself and her cat and she posted it to me. And it basically took off in this viral way where people all over the world are sending me troll hunting selfies. And so it might be just a picture of the book in China or one woman sent me herself in a, the book in a Japanese laundry or, you know, there are these incredible pictures. There's a, one of a ACT firefighter leaning against his truck reading the book and there's all these anti-domestic violence messages in the background. So all kinds of photos are being sent to me. I just got one right before we came on stage today. And the thing is, it's a message to me of love in a way. I, I've got to think about it some more because I don't know what the full meaning of it is, but people are reaching out to me and saying to me, we're with you and we're supporting you, we care about this, we've read the book, it has a meaning to us and we're sending it the love back to you. So it's not frivolous at all. I know sometimes people think the internet is frivolous. You know, obviously a lot of what I've talked about today is the internet doing a lot of damage. But my PTSD and my depression has been enormously helped by this incredible kind of groundswell of support. Like every time I get one, I'm filled with joy and I think, you know, this was worth it. This this terrible process of writing that had a huge impact on me, on my children, on my husband, on my family, you know, explaining this damage has an impact. I almost feel like it's the first domino, we just pushed it over and all the other ones are now starting to fall. Well, I want to thank you for your book, but thank even you. more importantly than the book, uh, the work that has gone into that book. Thank and I know you. it's had an incredible personal toll, but I've never read anything like it. And I know that everyone in the audience today is going to go rushing up <laughs> to the back of the room to get their hands on a copy because it is one of the most readable thrillers you'll ever read. And then you sit there and you're struck by the fact that it's real and you lived it. So thank you, Ginger. Thank and you. can everyone join me in putting their hands together for Ginger? Thank you, Jim Miller. Uh, for, we are going to turn to some audience questions and we have some microphones on either side of the room. Just before we do, I just want to let any, everyone know listening on the tape and also those in the room, uh, if this has brought up any issues for you, you can call Life, Lifeline on 13 10 11 or for women in the room who are experiencing violence online or in their own lives, uh, and there obviously is that intersection which Ginger touched on, you can call 1-800-RESPECT. Uh, we have some people with microphones, so please throw up your hand in the air if you've got a question. We're going to start over here on the right. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. That was fantastic and it's really interesting and horrifying at the same time. I'm just interested what you think when the law does catch up. What if... What do you think the response or the attitudes of the trolls that you spoke to, how do you think they would, have, they would react? Look, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I've said to Mark so many times, aren't you scared that the Federal Police, he's Australian, aren't you scared that the Federal Police are going to come and he, being narcissistic, which is actually part of that trait is that you don't have any self-preservation. Um, if you look in the DSM, so the Bible of psychology, um, he, they're not afraid. Like he said, I'm expecting it. I'm expecting it eventually. So there is a kind of fearlessness. Like Meep Sheep sent me a troll hunting selfie with his face in it. <laughs> and I said, dude, I'm not posting this because the FBI, he's in Colorado, the FBI is going to come and I'm not going to be responsible for you getting arrested and your syndicate coming after me. And he said, ah. Oh, you know, if they want to talk to me, they'll come anyway. They've come before. So uh, they're not afraid. <laughs> so uh, at the moment, they're not scared. Maybe uh, a combination of us hearing 
what's making them angry and the law changing will actually change the whole culture. But yeah, I'd love to say they'd be quaking in their boots, but they're not. <laughs> they're not going to be. But we might see a much kinder place online. You know, I mean, basically, I just think that the norms that you should expect in society should exist on the internet. You can't say and do those things on the internet. You know, the, it has to be the same. We are going to duck straight to the front row and we've got Carly Finlay, Hi, Carly. another author in the house. Uh, you're really tired. I am. Yeah. <laughs> do you think, though, you will continue the troll hunting um, initiative, escapade, whatever you might call it, taking it to the police or Facebook, Twitter? Do you think you'll be an educator in that? Beyond the book? I just want to say Carly is a case study in the book and it's one of the most incredible things that she did. She totally... Uh, Carly's a woman who um, identifies as someone who has a disability. She has a facial difference and she got mocked really badly on Reddit and what she did was incredible and it really made me think differently about how to respond to trolls. She actually educated them. She said, oh, gosh, sorry, I'm getting all excited with my hands and knocking over my water. But she actually said, like, I was afraid of putting my photo on the internet. I knew this would happen one day. I've got ichthyosis. Read all about it on my blog and totally turned all these vile comments about her around. And people started thanking her and saying thank you so much. And people with skin conditions said, I feel braver now. So, you know, she did something amazing. Um, but back to your... It's incredible that what, what Carly did. Um, but back to your question, look, I don't feel like there's a choice in this. I think that this is an emergency. And, uh, I mean, people say, why the hell would you go back into this after what happened to your family? Why would you, first of all, put your, your family went through it accidentally, you didn't see it coming, but then you chose to go back into it. Like, are you stupid? No. I mean, at some point, somebody has to stand up and do something. Otherwise, nothing's going to change. So, yes, I am very tired, but I'm not going to shut up until something changes, basically. I'll probably have a few rests in between. But um, I, I think it's urgent. I really do. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go over to the right-hand side of the room. We've got someone right in the middle of the row towards the back there with their hand up. You sat in a difficult place but we'll be with you in just a second. Go ahead. Oh, it was me. I thought you were someone at the front. Um, I've recently been trolled. Um, I'm an aged care advocate, and it's a very funny thing to think you've been trolled by being an aged care advocate. But I've chosen to ridicule them back. I mean, you make, really make ridiculous remarks back. And it isn't escalating. I thought it might escalate, but it's actually silenced them. And I wonder what you think about that approach. Look, I used to think, be silent to the trolls, not to each other. You know, there's this kind of thing, don't feed the trolls. And actually, I've really changed my thinking about that because it only has a limited use. So trolls are sadists and they want to hurt you. So sometimes silence can be a weapon because they want you to be hurt and upset. But particularly marginalised groups mustn't be silenced. And that's my worry about that advice because that's what the trolls are aiming for. So there are really powerful ways that you can use speech to be corrective and to fight back in different ways. And I think it really depends on the individual and your mental health space. So what I say to people is if your mental health is getting damaged, step away, reach out to your real life community uh, you know, and make sure that you're safe. But yes, there's lots of powerful ways to speak back. So the academic Susan Carland, you know, she's Walid Ali's wife, she taught me something incredibly powerful about this. So she gets trolled all the time and she gives a dollar to UNICEF every time she's trolled. I think she's up to like that or seven, six, seven thousand dollars. She actually uses mean girls gifs. <laughs> so, um, so she, you know, someone will say you're stupid Muslim whore or whatever, these horrible things they say to someone like her. And she will send back a gif of Regina George saying, why are you so obsessed with me? You know, and I was like, oh my God, this is brilliant. Because they want to see you hurt and upset, right? So that shows you're not hurt and upset, which is the same thing as what you're doing. But what I did with my book is when we released the cover of the book, I got D-level trolling, so not predator troll, but, you know, and they were saying, journalists are subhuman and whatever, and I was like, Susan Carland. So I started to screenshot them, and I was saying, Clayton thinks that I'm a subhuman cunt. Am I? 
buy my book and find out. And, um, <laughs> or, you know, Weave says I'm a lying whore. Why don't you find out and pre-order my book? And actually, like, <laughs> what happened was exactly, the trolling stops straight away because that's not what they want. They don't want to help promote and sell your book. But also... Um, I wrote on my Facebook, my professional page, Facebook page, I wrote, good morning, trolls. You know, thank you for visiting my page. Just letting you know that if you're going to troll me about my trolling book, I am feeding you into my publicity machine. And, uh, you know, I mean, stupid. Like, do you troll a trolling expert? <laughs> I've, been, I've been talking to you guys for five years. I know your game. But so that's one way. But uh, Pan America has put out a field guide to online harassment. So it, it's mainly for writers, but the advice is incredible. And there's some fantastic advice in there as well about how to use corrective speech. So if you're an activist um, and they're trolling you about something, how to be polite, how to gather other people around you to support you. So not troll back, not be sadistic, but be corrective. And I've been using that lately as well and it has really worked. So we're learning this stuff as we go. There's not one way, but, you know, if that's working for you, go for gold. I would just be really cautious about being sadistic, letting them turn you into a sadist. But, yeah, look, if it's working, go for it. <laughs> I think we've probably got time for one more question. I think we've got one just here. Um, where do you think businesses fit in with this? Like, for example, they had the latest Gillette ad came up on YouTube and that was trolled like crazy. Mm. Do you think that businesses might be able to hold social media to account? I would love to see businesses getting on board uh, with, you know, lobbying the government. Um, and there's another really important thing that comes up over and over again, and I'm increasingly getting contacted about this, which is this is an oh and s issue. So if you – lots of people are required to be online for their work. So what I'm thinking about right now is the Gillette staff who had to moderate that stuff. Their workplace has essentially probably, because nobody is training their staff in this, sent their staff onto an unsafe work site. So they have not trained their staff in how to deal with this, how to – what to expect, you know, it's like sending uh, a worker onto a work site that doesn't have high-vis gear and has no OH&S OH training. Um, there's a lawyer quoted in my book, his name is Roger Blow, he is a social media expert and he basically said that, you know, litigation by people like me who've been traumatised in the course of their work against employees is going to succeed. So workplaces are going to get sued for trauma and those claims are going to succeed. So I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a huge change in business. They're going to have to because they have to protect their employees and, you know, yes, hopefully they will lobby the government to see this change too because really it's going to affect their productivity and they're going to lose money because of it. They already are. You know, if I take six weeks off, on stress leave and the ABC has to pay me, you know, I mean, I have to say the ABC was hopeless when it happened to me. They had no idea. They said, call the EAP, the employee assistance, and I was saying, no, I want to know is someone going to kill my kids? I don't need to talk to a psychologist. So, yeah, these are, these are issues that we're right on the edge of and we're going to see change. Everybody, I want to thank you for coming along this evening. Thank you to Heidi Grant Publishing for giving us the wonderful ginger and to the Wheeler Centre for hosting us and to our wonderful Auslan interpreters who've been swapping around up here at the front. Uh, please take the time to head down the back and grab a copy of Ginger's book. You can buy one in this corner of the room and then Ginger's going to be over in the other corner of the room and she will sign your book for you and that way you can take your very own troll hunting selfie and you can piss off a bunch of trolls, which is surely the purpose of us all being here tonight. So please join me in thanking Ginger Gorman one more time. And thank you to Jamila. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. <laughs>